I will talk about uh, neuroaesthetics. Uh, it's relatively a new term, by the way. It was coined uh, by Semir Zeki, uh, and I'll mention some of his works uh, during the talk, and specifically on the beauty and creativity in the brain. And uh, since it's sort of also a summary lecture, uh, I will try to refer to the previous topics that's, that we've discussed before. So previously, uh, we, deal, we dealt with uh, different cognitive uh, functions and systems that allow us to perceive various forms of art, uh, music, uh, paintings, uh, visual art, cinema, and we touched even uh, uh, on the narrative. And uh, maybe the, the one thing that all of these forms of art have in common is that they touch us, yes? That's, they have an aesthetical component. That's what makes art. And uh, uh, why we have an aesthetic sense and how did it develop and how it's represented uh, in the brain is, is that would be actually the topic, uh, the uh, topic of this lecture. So I will start by describing uh, principles and origins of aesthetics. There is no consensus on them, so some of these ideas uh, are, uh, um, are uh, were developed by discussion uh, uh, with Alon and. Um, uh, we will uh, describe whether the uh, aesthetical perception has any reward, reward value. So we all know that uh, we, we like art, yes, it pleases us, so whether uh, it has a reward value or not. And um, uh, I'll talk about uh, a poss possibility that a beauty center exists in the, in the brain. So there is uh, a center for vision, there is a center uh, actually set several regions that um, encode fear, so whether there is a single brain region that encodes uh, beauty. And finally I will uh, describe some developments on creativity, whether it's possible to boost uh, creativity by various uh, manipulations of the brain and what is the origin of creativity. So let's start with the principles and origins of aesthetics. Um, so, a bit slow. <coughs> okay, so while, while this slide uh, loads, um, so Hagi Knaun in his first introductory lecture um, um, highlighted the fact that uh, maybe one, one of the things that, disc that uh, is attributed to beauty is that, uh, uh, that it's subjective. Each and one of us has its own uh, criterion for beauty. We can agree uh, or disagree whether uh, a person is beautiful or not. And uh, if you look uh, uh, culture in, in terms of development of uh, uh, beauty stereotypes in culture, uh, and over time, we see that they're very, very different. So, uh, in so probably in the in the first examples of uh, prehistoric art, uh, the, the standards of beauty had to do with fertility, and uh, later on different religious uh, traits uh, influence the way uh, which in which we perceive beauty. And uh, if we look at all these examples, it's really hard to say what makes uh, what was beautiful in different times. Uh, even uh, in, uh, in the 20th century uh, period, it looks like there is no universal uh, standard for beauty. And, uh, and probably the beauty, if such thing exists, is masked by uh, cultural and, uh, uh, and, and different traits that include fashion. Uh, and one example of for this is, for example, uh, the, uh, the skin, uh, uh, skin color. So it was, uh, it was sort of considered to be uh, more aesthetically pleasing uh, to have uh, a, a, a white, uh, uh, like not tainted skin uh, at, uh, at 
some hundred years ago because uh, tainted skin was associated with, with physical labor and working outside in the sun. Uh, during the time um, when um, the Industrial Revolution changed this uh, idea because uh, most of the work moved into the factory, so a person that is not exposed to the sun is probably somebody that can take vacation and has to work all the time uh, in the office or uh, in the factory. And the recent traits uh, with uh, um, all the health issues that comes with exposure to sun and skin cancer sort of made it again, the, that's what I've heard that the fashion now changed it and bright skin is, is again popular because it sort of signals uh, um, that the person is, is consciously aware of, of the danger uh, and, and health issues. Uh, and if you think that uh, it's hard to define only female beauty, uh, the same thing is true uh, uh, also for, um, for male standards of beauty. Uh, although maybe on, on, on the first instant you would think that maybe it would be easier to define what is a beautiful man, maybe somebody strong with well-developed uh, uh, muscles and physical strength, but, uh, but different examples of, uh, of a beautiful man, this is Lord Byron by the way, uh, and uh, etc. are not, not always correlated uh, with physical strength. There are other, other examples. Uh, so is there any uh, universal, universal property that defines what is beautiful, let's say in, uh, with respect to faces. Uh, if yes, it has to be something really evolutionary uh, conserved. And one thing that sort of hints to the fact that yes, such thing exists, is the fact that all cultures have this uh, ability, uh, even remote uh, uh, populations have the ability to, to say uh, this person is beautiful or not. So they have the aesthetic sense. So it probably uh, signals the fact that uh, it's evolutionary conserved. I mean, so yes. Say that the beauty is actually objective, not subjective? So we will try to, to see if, if there is any beauty uh, objective criterion for beauty. Mm -hmm. uh, and if yes, how it's represented in the brain. So that's an open question. Uh, probably I will not provide the, the definitive answer. This is something that uh, uh, people were exactly because, because of the fact that beauty is, is such a subjective thing, people were arguing about what is beauty uh, for centuries. Uh, so is there, if there is uh, something that is evolutionary concerned, the, the, the most uh, immediate uh, thing to propose is that beauty is, uh, our sense of beauty is uh, a tool that we have in order to evaluate um, the potential mating partners. Uh, and uh, what, uh, uh, what we propose is that uh, actually, uh, s because it's important, evolutionary speaking, uh, that the potential mating partner is some, somebody robust uh, robust and fertile, etc. So probably uh, what we focus on when we evaluate beauty is actually on the fragile components of, uh, of forms and patterns, because these are the, f the, the, the patterns that are the most uh, easy to, to, to break. Uh, so it's in a way, it's, it's a demonstration. If these patterns are intact, it's, it signals uh, that, uh, that uh, the, the subject is, is potent, it, it signals absence of diseases, absence of injuries, it signals that it's in the right age, uh, in general it's, it signals that the potential mating partner is uh, fertile. And, and, and this is, uh, if this principle is true, that should be also um, found in, uh, not only in humans, but in uh, evolution in general, and maybe the peacock is, uh, is, is the best example for that. Uh, uh, since it has such, such a beautiful uh, tail, it's really lo it's easy to, to find uh, defects in it, because it's so fragile. Just having uh, uh, slight, slight uh, damage to, the, to, to this uh, tail will be immediately uh, um, uh, noticeable. Uh, another idea that uh, 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 that was around uh, with respect uh, to why it's not 
related to beauty per se, but it might explain why the peacock has such a, a, an amazing tail, uh, is uh, the idea of the handicom principle, uh, or Ikaron Achbada, that uh, was proposed by uh, the Israeli uh, biologist Amos uh, Zahavi, uh, and where he, he claims that such a such, uh, tail and there are other examples, like the big horns of, uh, um, in, in, in some animals, uh, is, is really an evolutionary, um, an ev evolutionary negative uh, thing, because it really handicaps the animals. So a peacock with such a huge tail is more vulnerable to predators, uh, etc. But uh, since it survived, despite uh, this particular individual, despite having such a massive and, and clumsy tail, it signals the female, despite the fact that I'm sort of handicapped by this tail, I'm still potent and, uh, and, uh, and therefore uh, attractive uh, in terms of the uh, reproduction. Uh, reproduction. So, um, so if uh, uh, this principle is indeed and I'm talking about the fact that our attention uh, to beauty is actually attention to, that beauty is actually an attention to uh, fragile elements, uh, then uh, uh, what we will find beautiful is manifestations of, uh, of intactness of these elements. And uh, um, probably the easiest way to uh, detect uh, defects, uh, according to this, is by uh, looking at deviations from symmetry. Uh, because uh, if some, so something uh, is, is not symmetric and we as most of the animals are, has, have a, a bilateral symmetry, if something is not symmetrical it means uh, that, that it's damaged. Uh, and indeed uh, a lot of uh, patterns that, that we recognize as beautiful in nature and probably are attractive uh, for the potential uh, mating partners are indeed symmetrical. So, uh, in all these cases, the symmetry is exposed. It's immediately noticeable if, 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 if some deviation from uh, symmetry occurs. Uh, so, uh, so what we will discuss in the next few slides, whether symmetry equals beauty uh, or not. Uh, and uh, um, so far we were talking about uh, really sort of hardcore evolutionary biology, uh, uh, but uh, beauty has, we, we evaluate uh, some human-made artifacts as beautiful, paintings, art in general, not only uh, physical uh, uh, subjects. So uh, this notion of symmetry uh, is actually a very ancient uh, uh, concept in, uh, in, human, uh, uh, in human anthropology and uh, um, so um, First stone tools were, were produced by stone knap napping, this uh, procedure of uh, hitting one stone against the other. And uh, about 1.8 million years old, there were already uh, stone tools like that, but uh, they lacked any symmetry. About 1.4 million years uh, ago, a symmetrical uh, uh, tools emerged. This is uh, uh, um, actually the sharp part of the of the axe. Uh, it, it, they, they had um, some symmetry, it wasn't perfect, but they were already symmetrical. And some three, uh, 300,000 uh, uh, years ago, we started to find uh, really perfect symmetrical tools. So this uh, ancient uh, um, tool makers, or maybe even artists, if you would uh, like to call them so, uh, were really paying attention to symmetry and, and were trying to achieve perfection uh, in that. And uh, there is a whole uh, field uh, in neuroscience that deals with trying to, uh, um, to infer from the tools that, that we find what kind of brain pathways uh, these uh, prehistoric people had by, for example, scanning uh, the brain of modern days stone uh, 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 stone tool makers and trying to infer which pathways uh, probably existed in, in, uh, in the ancient ones as well. Um, and the uh, artists, modern artists, uh, were, were very well aware of our exceptional uh, ability to detect uh, uh, symmetries and asymmetries. Uh, so this is maybe 
the most beautiful example uh, of this notion, this is a painting by the Hungarian uh, painter uh, Cintvali Koska. And uh, when you look at, at the face of, of this old man, um, you immediately see that, that something, something is strange here. Uh, and, and basically, that the, the left part of his face is, is, is different from the right part. Uh, so, so maybe the whole face is a bit is a bit thicker, and the nose is is not exactly symmetrical, uh, etc. And um, uh, and few years ago, the mystery of this portrait was sort of revealed. So, if we look, uh, if we just uh, put a line in the middle of this painting, and uh, uh, make uh, look at the painting from the mirror, positioned at uh, right at the midline. So if we took look at uh, the left part of the painting, what we'll see is, is this man. When we look at the right part, that's what we see. And uh, Cintrali Koska was a mystical uh, person, so pro a possible interpretation of this painting is that God and devil exists in all of us. Uh, and, uh, uh, and maybe this is one of the really best examples of use of these asymmetries uh, um, in art. So, so is beauty equal symmetry? Um, and uh, the answer from this uh, Nissan campaign uh, probably that is not. That uh, uh, yes, uh, cross culturally there is a tendency, and this was tested in, in various uh, groups, uh, to classify people. Uh, more or less sy with symmetrical faces as more beautiful than those with asymmetries, but symmetry per se uh, doesn't equal beauty. So then, so then, what is beauty? What, what, what is the uh, uh, what is the hidden pattern that signals us that the person is beautiful or not? Uh, so if this is not symmetry, uh, uh, so maybe also in in, uh, in artistic examples. Uh, in, in abstract forms, symmetry uh, equals or, or, or doesn't equal beauty. So in this, uh, uh, in this experiment, uh, different patterns were shown. Some were uh, symmetrical, like, like this one, and some were, uh, were asymmetrical. And, uh, and the subjects had to judge uh, uh, for, for, for each uh, so sometimes they had to answer for, 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 let's say, for this particular example, if it's uh, beautiful or not. And uh, in other cases, they were asked for a different pattern, whether it's symmetrical or not. And uh, um, this is a bit complex uh, slide, but the, bottom, uh, uh, but, uh, the bottom line is that different maps emerge for uh, aesthetic versus symmetrical judgment. So uh, if we contrast aesthetic versus symmetry judgment. So in other words, people have, these are regions that were active more when that people had to say if something is uh, aesthetically pleasing or not. And these are the brain regions that were active more for a question of whether something is symmetrical or not. And, uh, and these two maps were different. So the uh, cognitive evaluation of symmetry and, uh, and beauty are, uh, are segregated in the brain. And uh, one interesting thing is that on top of that, uh, a, a different area, uh, the frontal medial cortex, which is uh, close to a region that we will uh, discuss later on as a putative center for beauty, the orbitofrontal cortex, was more active for beautiful versus non-beautiful patterns. So, uh, so this is sort of another proof that uh, uh, symmetry and beauty are not the same thing. So then what is beauty? Maybe beauty is, uh, is, is a more general thing, like fertility. Uh, and, uh, and prehistoric art was actually very much focused on fertility. Um, this, this is an example of one of the uh, oldest uh, and all the sculptures, and, and, and you can see that, that this, uh, this is probably a, uh, was probably a fertility uh, uh, a goddess. Um, and, uh, and you can see that uh, all, uh, all this concept of fertility is very, very exaggerated um, in, uh, in this example. So maybe this is a general uh, characteristic of, um, 
uh, of what we find beautiful. And uh, one of the things that uh, are different between between the genders, at, at least in the in the Western society, uh, is uh, the waist to hip ratio. So there were many studies showing that estrogen uh, uh, results in uh, in uh, in fat deposition. Um, in, in women that results uh, uh, that leads to a lower waist to hip ratio uh, than, than what uh, than the case in, uh, in males and uh, there were many studies that were linking uh, a different ratio of the waist to of waist to hips uh, towards different diseases including uh, early uh, um, onset age uh, early age uh, onset diabetes and, uh, and infertility and uh, the lack of this disease was associated with low waist to hip ratio. So that's sort of OSP-like figure that uh, the Western society uh, chose uh, as, uh, as, as the standard for, uh, uh, for beauty. And, uh, and in this paper that was published in Nature, this is by the way taking, is that from an uh, image from this paper that was taken from the American uh, Psychology Association, uh, a remote population uh, um, that uh, didn't have uh, any contacts with, with Western media and were not exposed to Western-like standards of beauty had to evaluate uh, their preference, um, they had to rate this, 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 this uh, uh, women that were different in their waist to hip ratio by parameters of attractiveness, uh, healthiness, and uh, the degree to which they, uh, they could be potential, uh, potential spouses. Uh, so these uh, women have a, a high waist to hip ratio and these uh, females have a low waist to hip ratio and, and they have different weights. So this is sort of the normal weight, this is overweight and this is underweight. And uh, the, uh, the preference of the Western uh, male uh, choosers, uh, uh, participants was to choose this uh, um, as, as, as their uh, model standard. So what happens with this remote population? This is a, a population in Peru, it's a Yomibato tribe. Uh, and, and, uh, and here you have uh, the, uh, the Western uh, males. And here are two different tribes that uh, ethnically are very similar to, to the Yomibato tribe, but they had diff various increasing exposure to the Western uh, culture. So they were living uh, uh, nearby the Yomibato, but had much more contacts with Westerners. Uh, and, and, and this is the uh, correlation of the attractiveness, healthiness, and preferred spouse score to the waist to hip ratio. So you can see that, for example, for attractiveness, the uh, remote Yomibato tribe prefer actually high waist to hip ratio uh, um, than, than the male, than the, than the Western. Uh, uh, group and uh, they also scored uh, the, the figure with higher waist to hip ratio as also more healthy and uh, also as more uh, more preferred uh, in terms of choo as being uh, uh, chosen as a spouse. Uh, while while the Westerners were uh, consistently choosing uh, the the other type, the low waist to hip ratio. As, as more attractive, more healthy, and more preferred. Uh, while uh, the, the, the other tribes had a sort of intermediate preference. Uh, and and this, is, uh, this is interesting for many reasons. The first, it, it shows that indeed uh, our sense of beauty, attractiveness, has to do with evaluation of partners and with evaluation of health of the individual. And uh, because uh, uh, all these parameters were, were uh, the same, that the, the figure was chosen, uh, the same figure based on attractiveness, healthiness, and preferred spouse. Uh, but uh, even more, it says that, uh, that maybe this uh, waste to hip ratio thing uh, um, is, is, is not a universal principle at all, although the Western society sort of uh, imposes it, uh, uh, and uh, with, uh, as the authors of this paper claim that with disappearance of remote population, it maybe will be impossible uh, to, to to actually um, 
really uh, understand if this is a universal principle or not, because now we are all exposed uh, to sort of universal uh, uh, media. And what is interesting uh, in terms of just as an anecdote, uh, uh, the participants of the study had to uh, actually describe the health status of, uh, of, of these figures. And while this figure was, was uh, described as, as healthy and normal, the, the Barbie-like low waste to hip ratio was described as suffering from severe diarrhea and probably almost dead. That's, that's a quote from the uh, participant. So whether it's a universal principle or not, uh, whether this tribe isn't really outlier in terms of their aesthetical appreciation or not, that's, uh, that's an open question. Uh, so so let's uh, uh, move for a second to, to animals and try to see how they evaluate um, uh, forms, uh, abstract forms. So a, a very well-known uh, uh, phenomenon is called the pick shift uh, uh, in the following paradigm. So the rat is trained to choose a slightly more rectangular stimuli to, to get a reward over a, a, a square pattern. And uh, after it learns that it has to prefer uh, this over that, in a, in a taste uh, trial, uh, it's either shown with the same pattern that it's been rewarded before, or even more exaggerated, more rectangular pattern, and the, and the choice is transferred actually to the more rectangular pattern. So what the animal uh, chooses here is not between that stimulus stimulus versus that, it, it really actually prefers rectangularity. And, uh, and the more rectangular the, the shape is, the more uh, it is preferred by the animal. So this transfer of, um, uh, of preference to form is called the pick shift. And, uh, uh, and, and another famous related example is uh, uh, the work, uh, the work uh, by Tinbergen, a, a, a famous uh, zoologists that found that uh, seagull, seagull chicks have an interesting behavior pattern. So the young chicks, uh, they peck on the mother's beak uh, on the red spot here in order to receive reward. Uh, well, reward, I'm sorry, to receive food. <laughs> um, and uh, so, so, uh, so he conducted a series of experiments. So first he uh, measured the pecking rate for a natural head and it was pretty high. Then he replaced the head with a model of the head, and uh, there was still a high rate on pecking. Then he took the model head and removed the beak, and the pecking disappeared, so it was really responding to the, to the beak. Then he removed the red spot from the uh, beak, and there was no pecking. And then when he just introduced the beak with a red spot, the, red, the, the pecking rate increased. But the most striking thing that when he uh, replaced the beak uh, with just a pencil with three red spots, the, the, the chick started to peck like crazy. So that was like a super beak, a super stimulus. And, uh, and this led, uh, several decades later, uh, uh, Ramachandran, uh, one of uh, the cognitive uh, uh, scientists, the most influential ones that that's were like dealing with uh, uh, with, uh, with art, uh, to propose that uh, actually uh, art represents a pick shift principle, at least uh, different forms of art, uh, like, like this uh, uh, erotic Indian art, um, and, and probably also uh, our uh, Western beauty standards. So in a way he says that maybe if you put a seagull, uh, make a gallery, uh, uh, an art gallery for seagulls. So what they would put in the in the in the middle of the gallery would be this huge stick with uh, yellow stick with huge red spots on it, and that would be considered to be beautiful because that is the super stimuli for uh, st stimulus for their for the neurons. And probably also we, when we go to the abstract art gallery and we see this red square over a blue. Uh, uh, background, maybe that's sort, sort of a super stimulus for our uh, certain neurons in our visual system. Uh, but it is more evident with, with more complex forms of art. Well, I don't say that abstract art is not complex, but um, uh, so he suggested that basically these figures that, that, that are very feminine and, and, and uh, uh, g give us uh, uh, sort of um, a, a, a pleasing effect, 
uh, it's actually exaggerated subtraction of the male form from the female form. So you subtract, so you get the difference between the, uh, the, the male and the female form and exaggerate it. And that's what, what you get. So uh, he suggested that basically all art is a form of exaggeration according to this pick shift uh, uh, principle. Uh, all art is a caricature, in other words. So, uh, so that's what's a general uh, statement about art, but let's come back to beauty. Uh, is beauty is also a sort of caricature of the normal average face uh, that was exaggerated, uh, according to the pick shift principle, along certain relevant uh, dimensions. Uh, so maybe relevant dimensions for assessment of, of all these uh, uh, um, physiological traits like age, uh, male to female differences, maybe it lies along uh, certain features like eyes, lips, nose, ears. So for example, uh, so um, I actually don't know if this is true or not, that, that females have slightly uh, bigger eyes and, and lips than males. What, what, is sh uh, uh, what is known for sure is that as we grow older, some parts of our uh, face continue to grow, like nose and ears. So it's, 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 it can be used as a way to assess age. So maybe a certain, a certain uh, combination uh, of this, that's what produces uh, the universal beauty standard. Uh, so for that, uh, a prerequisite is that actually there is some coding of an average face in the brain. And uh, uh, different works uh, uh, that study from uh, uh, several years ago in Nature and um, next study I'll show actually hint on the fact that indeed a, a code for ne a representation of an average face exists in the brain. So this is, uh, is, uh, is done in monkeys. These are single neuron recordings in one of the face patch areas. And uh, uh, so this is sort of a normalized face. There are computer algorithms that can uh, get sort of average face. And then you start to exaggerate it uh, along, uh, uh, along one of the uh, dimensions. And, uh, and you get that while the neuron uh, response has a baseline uh, response to the average phase, as you exaggerate it, as you move away from the average phase representation, uh, the neuron starts to fire more. So, so these neurons actually detect deviation from, from the averageness uh, uh, of the face, and this was proposed as a mechanism of general face recognition that, uh, uh, that I, I described a little bit and Alon was talking about in, in previous lectures uh, with respect to uh, this particular sensitivity of our brain to faces, um, that basically we, we recognize that, uh, that this is my neighbor and this is my PI, etc., by subtracting the different features that each of these individual faces possess from, from the average face that, that we store in, in, in our memory. And uh, uh, this might explain also why we habituate to beauty, or even more, habituate to ugliness. So somebody can um, be perceived as is ugly in the beginning, and probably we, we, we all experience that. And as we sort of live along the person, uh, we, we habitu uh, habituate it. So maybe the norm, this average face that we, that we have, is changing. So another uh, sort of um, uh, piece of evidence uh, is, is uh, uh, th this another mo monkey uh, physiological study coming from the Tsao and Livingstone uh, group. Uh, uh, which actually Doris Tsao was the one who dis described the face patch areas in the, in the monkeys and I was uh, already describing some of her results. So what she found uh, that there are uh, neurons tuned to different, uh, so if there is, a, there, there is a, this different parameters of uh, faces, so for example, I'm sorry that it's hard to see, for example, a eyebrow uh, width uh, well, the hair weights, uh, eyebrow slant, uh, inter-eye distance. So, for example, here you, you move uh, from, uh, uh, from almost no hair to large, uh, to white hair width. Uh, eyebrow slant from uh, 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 negative eyebrow slant to positive eyebrow slant. And this is the inter-eye distance from very closely positioned eyes to uh, distantly positioned eyes. And there are 
all, all other types of parameters. So you can see that the neuron is responding to a particular combination, uh, to, to per particular features. So it's, in this case, it's, it's responding to inter-eye distance, to, uh, uh, to iris size, etc., and, and doesn't care about others. And the more you go along this direction, the more uh, this neuron responds. So, so indeed, and if you think uh, in terms of population codings, the different neurons have different preferences like that. And, and together uh, they, they can uh, uh, be sensitive to deviations from this average phase. So if beauty is indeed an exaggeration uh, from uh, a deviation from the average phase along the relevant dimension, then maybe a, a peak shift of the beautif beautiful face, exaggeration of the beautiful face, will be even more beautiful. Uh, but this is probably not the case. Uh, so uh, so this, this leads to the following conclusion. Either beauty is something else, it's not a kind of uh, ordered, uh, a coherent deviation from uh, uh, from the average phase, or that the peak shift principle has a limit. So you can go and become more and more uh, beautiful, let's say, uh, uh, that, and I don't want to, to focus on this particular example, but, but uh, uh, bigger eyes, bigger lips, smaller uh, nose. But at certain point, if you, if you go, uh, it becomes a caricature. It's not beautiful anymore. So this is one of... Uh, of the ideas that you would like to propose. So, uh, so that's the first, uh, uh, the first part on the uh, principle and origins of aesthetics. And uh, as, um, as we probably all know, uh, uh, art and aesthetical uh, experience is often rewarding. We, we, we go to concerts, we, we go to art galleries, we enjoy it, we, we feel uh, uh, we feel really rewarded for doing so. So is, uh, is, is it indeed uh, activating the reward uh, circuits in the brain? So two areas that I'm going to talk uh, in this part is the orbitofrontal cortex, is the region uh, of the frontal cortex positioned uh, behind the eyes behind the, the orbits uh, uh, of the eyes. It's uh, received inputs from all sensory modalities, including visual and auditory, and this is important because this region was, uh, I will actually jumping forward, uh, this was uh, the region that was proposed as the center for beauty for both uh, musical and uh, visual beauty. It's strongly connected to another region that I will uh, talk about, the nucleus accumbens, that's part of the reward system. And uh, uh, the pathology of the orbitofrontal cortex involves uh, actually a, a poor judgment of, uh, uh, of um, evaluation of rewards. So for example, one famous task is when the person has to prefer consistently uh, uh, a, a less rewarding um, stimuli, in that case, case a, a deck of cards, uh, which brings low rewards but consistent rewards versus uh, a, a high rewards which comes uh, also often with, with uh, losing. So the orbital frontal cortex was, uh, was associated with, with this condition, with the, the correct uh, behavior in this task. And also people with uh, damage to orbital frontal cortex were reported to have absence of regret feelings. So its putative function uh, was proposed as calculating the value of a reward outcome by assessing the trades of the utility and comparing with other potential reward outcomes. The other area uh, that the orbital frontal cortex connects to is the nucleus accumbens. It's part of the reward circuitry. Uh, it connects uh, uh, strongly uh, to the ventral tegmentular areas. It contains dopaminergic neurons and to the prefrontal cortex. And it is involved in uh, drug addiction, depression, uh, actually the euphoric feeling uh, uh, of enduring cocaine addiction is associated with um, release of dopamine in this area. And it was also uh, a target for ablation surgery uh, as a treatment for uh, alcoholism in China. Uh, so it's basically a center that is uh, considered to be a reward mediator. So uh, if aesthetical experience is, uh, is linked to reward, then probably we would expect that these centers would be activated when, when we experience uh, or uh, evaluate beauty. Uh, so in this study, uh, uh, subjects had to 
uh, heterosexual subjects had to um, uh, evaluate uh, attractiveness of photographs of the opposite sex. Uh, and two areas were highlighted during, uh, they were correlated. The more, uh, um, the more attractive uh, the photograph was, according to the uh, subject report, the more activation uh, was in these areas. So one was the nucleus accumbens, and the other was the orbital frontal cortex. It was interesting that the orbital frontal cortex was linked uh, uh, to, to higher uh, evaluation uh, uh, rates only in males. Uh, and uh, that led the, the authors to suggest that this sex difference in the uh, orbital frontal cortex activity may provide a potential mechanism underlying the reason why men identify attractiveness as a stronger motivation in mate selection. Uh, so sort of it's more involved in the, in the decision making while uh, on the reward uh, level uh, uh, the nucleus accumbens is activated uh, uh, both in males and females. So, uh, so maybe beauty is 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 just a reward. Some, something that uh, is beautiful is something that we define as as rewarding or as potentially rewarding in the future. Uh, so, one way uh, uh, to dissociate it in, be, between uh, these two was uh, the idea. I think is quite elegant. Was published in urine uh, uh, 10 years ago. So uh, again, heterosexual subjects had to evaluate uh, beautiful female faces versus average female faces, uh, and also beautiful male faces versus uh, uh, average male faces. And, uh, and they were scoring the, the beautiful female uh, and the beautiful male faces th this was done on, in males as beautiful. So the males considered uh, both female and males, uh, certain types, as beautiful. Uh, but then uh, this was dissociated from the degree to which they were attracted to this subject. And that's what measured by, uh, by actually key pressing. So in order to keep the same photograph for more time, they had to, uh, um, to press certain combination of keys, otherwise it will change. So it was found that males press more uh, only for, for what they define as beautiful females, but not for what they define as beautiful male. So there is a difference between uh, uh, beauty, aesthetical appreciation, and attractiveness. And what these authors found is that the degree of activation of reward areas was not going along the aesthetical judgment of beauty, but actually was going along uh, the attractiveness uh, um, uh, of, of uh, the degree of attractiveness. So at least for, for female faces. So the, the nucleus accumbens was activated more for beautiful female faces than the average male, uh, than the average faces, but, uh, but beautiful males were not activating more the nucleus accumbens, maybe even the other way around. Uh, so, so this probably suggests that reward circuitry uh, per se does not include aesthetical judgment. So beauty is not reward per se, at least uh, uh, our evaluation of, of beautiful faces. Me, yes? And what about uh, homosexual subjects, for instance? Uh, well, I don't know. Yeah, I, I would expect that yes, but I, I don't, I'm not aware of any studies that... Uh, mm, there is actually a handful, really a handful of studies that were... This is a new, a new, a new field. So maybe more studies will come, but uh, uh, but at least this dissociation between attractiveness and beauty, I think, uh, will well hints that it really follows the, the attractiveness and not just uh, abstract concept of, of beauty. Uh, so speaking of abstract concept, uh, uh, art. Uh, we can consider art as beautiful, but it's not necessarily something attractive, uh, that, 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 that is attractive, at least uh, in, in sexual terms. Uh, so uh, in this study, uh, a comparison between art uh, and non-art uh, was evaluated. And, and interestingly, uh, uh, the orbital frontal cortex, the ventral striatum, which is, uh, 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 which is a, uh, the nucleus accumbens is part of, uh, and the cerebellum uh, were, were linked uh, uh, to, to viewing 
art versus non-art images. And, uh, and the, the author sort of claims that it's a well-known principle in design that if you link uh, a certain product with artistic uh, component, uh, the consumers uh, evaluate it uh, as more um, as more expensive and more more uh, like a better a better product than just a non-artistic uh, one. So uh, they claim that not only these re areas responded to art versus non-art, uh, uh, the art uh, images has also a reward value. So uh, regardless of that, it, it shows that uh, in this sort of uh, pure aesthetic judgment, uh, a reward area uh, is, um, is involved. Uh, so what about uh, aesthetic preference uh, uh, for painting in general? Um, so in this study, uh, the subjects were shown with, uh, with different stimuli. This, in this case, a painting by Van Gogh, a painting by Kandinsky, a painting by Gauguin, and uh, a painter, a, a painting by an abstract painter that I never heard of. Uh, and uh, uh, the images were either original or were altered. For example, here in the Kandinsky painter, one of the dots, of the three dots here, was moved or uh, filtered. Uh, so, uh, those who've been to Dory Deldikman's lecture who know that uh, for at least those. Uh, uh, if the, the concept that, that probably Kandinsky uh, uh, wanted to, to express, uh, th this change might be, might be big, at least if, 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 the, if the subjects uh, were aware of it. So, um, and, uh, and the subjects had to rate the different, uh, the different original modulate or the modified paintings, uh, and the degree uh, of the, this rating was, was associated with activation in uh, other regions, that those that we discussed before, one of that is another region uh, uh, of the uh, of the reward circuitry, uh, the caudate nucleus, and uh, actually this this region is involved uh, in uh, in depression, and uh, uh, the low was the uh, when the preference to paintings was low, so the, the subjects didn't like the painting. Uh, this region had a reduced activation, and as the liked. Uh, the painting more and more, the activation was uh, more and more approaching baseline. Uh, in, the, in another region, the single-edged sulcus, here uh, uh, the activity was increasing with the preferred, uh, uh, as, as the subjects preferred the, the, uh, the painting more and more. So the bottom line of, of all these uh, four studies that I presented, that maybe the reward area is associated with aesthetical uh, aesthetical um, evaluation, but uh, uh, if this is the case, it's not one single area that that, that is uh, that is doing so. So, uh, okay. So let's let's continue for uh, maybe another ten minutes and uh, and then take a break. Um, so. So far, we spoke about paintings and and visual uh, response to other either art or, uh, or human subjects. Uh, but another modality uh, that um, r is really pleasing for us humans is music. And, uh, and Ronnie Granot in her lecture uh, sort of described music as a cheesecake, this artificial uh, product uh, that uh, although we were not exposed to it uh, um, like evolutionary speaking to modern music, we still very much uh, uh, enjoy it and, uh, and probably it hints that it has evolutionary uh, role. So some people enjoy music so much that they have experiencing chills, these, these tremors when they hear their, their uh, uh, preferred uh, uh, musical piece. And uh, in this subject, in this, in this study, the subjects were asked to bring their favorite musical pieces that really touched them to the scanner, and their brain was scanned while they were anticipating this, this, this chill and actually experiencing the chills. So using a technique uh, uh, called positron em emission tomography, where you actually can uh, follow after uh, neurotransmitter concentration in the brain by 
uh, by uh, by introducing a, a, a chemical uh, agent that binds this uh, this neurotransmitter, it was found that uh, in the nucleus accumbens uh, during chills there was a, a reduction in the signal, which actually uh, indicates that there is increase in uh, the secretion of dopamine to the area during the chills. So that was uh, bilateral in the left and in the right nucleus accumbens. So during chills. Uh, this subject really had uh, release of dopamine into the area and uh, in a way similar to, to what happens in these euphoric moments in cocaine addiction that I mentioned before. And these two regions, the, the nucleus accumbens and the caudate nucleus, had different, uh, uh, different activation in the different phases. So the caudate nucleus uh, also called uh, the dorsal striatum is more active during the anticipation towards the, this, this intense uh, um, uh, experience and the right nucleus accumbens is active during the chill itself. So music is really rewarding. The, the question is to which extent it is rewarding. Uh, if it's rewarding we, we, we can pay money for, for such rewards. And, uh, uh, and uh, while preparing on this lecture, I discovered that uh, actually the Paul McCartney's uh, uh, concert in Tel Aviv was the most expensive concert in Israel. People were paying, were willing to pay 500 shekels for st standing places and 1,500 shekels for sitting in the concert. So people really uh, can pay, uh, are willing to pay money for, for experience of music. And this study actually uh, checked uh, in the scanner the, the subjects were, uh, were listening to, uh, to novel musical pieces and, and then uh, they were asked how much money they are willing to pay for, for each uh, of these musical pieces to, to buy it. Uh, and it was, uh, it was found that, again, the, uh, the nucleus accumbens and the uh, caudate nucleus, this, these two regions involved in reward, were activated more uh, during listening to the uh, musical pieces that were later on the subjects were willing to buy. So, so they were really uh, experiencing sort of a reward uh, uh, related activation and this is how it looks during time so there is increased activation in the right nucleus accumbens, the right caudate for pieces uh, that uh, uh, the subjects were willing to pay for versus uh, pieces that the subjects uh, refused to pay for. So music is really rewarding. Um, so uh, so other, are other forms of art, are they rewarding or not? Uh, and maybe not even art, just perceptual experience is rewarding. For example, uh, well, yeah, probably all familiar uh, uh, with this illusion, somebody doesn't all see what is here. Uh, well, if somebody doesn't, it's the Dalmatin dog. Uh, and, uh, and, and usually people experience it all of a sudden. So you, 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 once you see the dog, it's impossible not to see it anymore. And Ramachandran proposed that this uh, binding and grouping principle that uh, Dory discussed in his lecture uh, is actually uh, so strong that we can't get rid of because once it's there, it's associated with reward activation, limbic activation, uh, because maybe the ultimate function of the brain is to achieve understanding of the world around us, and this understanding is, is rewarded. So maybe also uh, a more complex arts which involve semantic knowledge and actually understanding of the, uh, of the, of the art form is rewarding because of this uh, sort of so solving the riddle of, of the art piece. Uh, which is also uh, rewarding according to Ramachandran. And then uh, uh, finally uh, um, another thing that, uh, that is linked to, might be linked to reward, reward is that novelty and surprise are probably rewarding as well and this is seen in art and, and particularly in fashion that uh, probably the reason why while uh, deviation from, from standard shape into more extravagant forms, breaking the symmetry, uh, changing the proportions and uh, uh, going from, from classical to, uh, uh, to really colorful uh, uh, designs 
are, uh, um, we, we find it beautiful uh, because it's novel and, uh, and surprising, which is, uh, which is the thing that uh, might be linked with, with reward. So maybe beauty uh, is associated with, uh, with reward. So, uh, so let's take a break and, and then we continue uh, discussing whether a beauty center exists in the brain. So, after dealing with uh, the topic of uh, existence or absence of uh, aesthetical principles, which we saw is, is a sort of complex topic by itself, because it's hard to pinpoint uh, one universal aesthetical principle, we'll go to even, uh, just a second, to even a, a more uh, sort of challenging uh, question of whether there is a beauty center uh, of the brain, although we sort of failed to, to define beauty in objective uh, 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 meaning, but maybe uh, despite uh, absence of, of one single universal objective criteria for beauty, there is a, 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 a physical center that still uh, does the subjective evaluation uh, of beauty. Yes? So I wanted to ask you whether there was any study done about uh, beauty and complexity, whether complex patterns appear to us more beautiful than, because I could imagine that like we, we saw these tools and they yep. become over time not only more symmetrical but they also become more complex, right? Yeah. As well as uh, all kinds of art. So the only studies that uh, I'm aware of is uh, the ones that I presented in the beginning were uh, uh, symmetrical versus beautiful patterns were compared. So these are not tools, these are just geometric patterns. Uh, and well, as, as, as you've heard, the, the answer is that symmetry and, and beauty is different. So if you replace uh, 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 beauty by complexity, maybe, maybe uh, you, you, can, you can ask, ask the same question. But uh, I'm not aware of, of uh, studies that deliberately uh, address this point. Uh, but yes, that's like if art piece or just a general phenomenon is, is a riddle that the brain solves and maybe the more complex the riddle is and if we succeed the more rewarding and the more beautiful it, it's, I mean, we, we are familiar with, you know, in mathematics some equations seem to us beautiful, you know, after, uh, after we realize the, the complexity and, and, the, and, the, and the power of, of, of this concept. So, so maybe these things are indeed related. So a beauty center in the brain. So uh, Seymour Zeki, that, uh, uh, as I said before, is the sort of the founder of, uh, of the field of neuroesthetics, or at least the one who defined it. And he he uh, uh, he holds he's a professor of neuroesthetics. Actually, there is uh, this this formal title. Uh, so he came uh, with a series of papers recently trying to identify this, this locus in the brain uh, that uh, is a universal evaluator or at least a, a, is correlating, correlated with uh, uh, a evaluation of beauty. So uh, the way he did it, he, he uh, said, okay, uh, beauty is not only visual, uh, uh, visual effects, also music. Uh, elicits beauty, so let's go for an area uh, that is highlighted for uh, beautiful visual stimuli and for uh, beautiful musical stimuli. So first subjects had to rate the different stimuli uh, according to whether they're uh, ugly, neutral, or beautiful. And then uh, uh, the correlation of, uh, uh, of, of, of this uh, uh, um, uh, of this evaluation was uh, and tested in fMRI, so uh, uh, several regions uh, popped up for uh, for visual beautiful stimuli. One of them, the strongest activation, was in the orbital frontal cortex, that uh, we discussed before, and it was also active for for musical stimuli. That's the same uh, that the same brain uh, shown from different uh, um, uh, different um, uh, sections and uh, uh, and if you superimpose the visual and the auditory activation for beautiful stimuli which the subjects define as beautiful we see in yellow this, this regions for conjunctive uh, visual and auditory uh, beautiful activation which coincide with the orbitofrontal cortex 
and uh, the relationship uh, uh, was uh, uh, was uh, was linear, uh, almost linear for uh, both the visual stimuli and the musical stimuli. So beautiful stimuli uh, of both modalities elicited a stronger activation in the orbital frog the frontal cortex, and uh, and the more uglier were the stimulation, the less activation. Uh, was in the in this in this area. Uh, ugliness per se, however, was correlated with different uh, regions. Uh, so uh, increased uh, increasingly ugly visual stimuli were uh, actually eliciting activation in the amygdala, this region that um, is uh, mediating fear response, which actually makes sense. We see something ugly, visually ugly. Sometimes, usually, it's something that also. Uh, often it's something that scares us. And uh, 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 auditory ugly stimuli, so unpleasant auditory s stimuli in a way, uh, were eliciting uh, activation in the somatomotor area, which also makes sense because probably if you hear something uh, aversive, you want to, to move away from it. So uh, while orbital frontal cortex uh, was suggested here as uh, 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 as the beauty center, and the paper is entitled uh, 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 Towards uh, Brain uh, uh, Theory of Beauty. Uh, the ugliness is correlated with, uh, uh, with other regions. Um, and uh, uh, if you remember uh, the lecture by Hagi Knan, uh, uh, when, when he defined what is uh, uh, aesthetical uh, judgment, uh, he referred to this Kantian notion that while uh, perceptual judgment is something, something objective, as aesthetical judgment uh, is, uh, is by definition a subjective thing. So we can, I can say that the sunset is red, and this is an objective perceptual property uh, of the sunset, but I can say uh, that it's uh, uh, beautiful or it's, uh, it brings some sadness, etc., and which will be uh, my personal subjective uh, uh, response. So Kant uh, was saying the following. If we wish to discern whether something is beautiful or not, we do not relate the representation of it to its object by means of rational understanding. The judgment of taste, in other words, aesthetical judgment, therefore is not a cognitive judgment, is not logical, but is aesthetic. And uh, he adds, uh, every reference of representation is capable of being objective, even that of sensation. So in other words, sensations are objective. I feel pain, and that's, although I report as a subject of it, it's, it's linked to some, some objective uh, property. The one exception to this is the feeling of pleasure or displeasure. This denotes nothing in the object, but is a feeling which the subject has within itself, and in the, matter, in, in the manner in which it is affected by the representation. So this distinction between perceptual uh, judgment versus aesthetic judgment is, uh, is crucial if we want to define a beauty center in the brain. Because if it's really something that is dealing with beauty and beauty only, uh, it uh, should not be involved in a sort of lower level of perceptual judgment. And in a paper that was a uh, sort of continuation of, of uh, uh, of the paper I showed you before, by the same authors, it was published, I think, last month. Uh, the aesthetic judgment was, was compared for perceptual judgment. Um, and uh, uh, the subjects were shown uh, uh, to stimuli, and they were, uh, had to be compared for which one of them is more beautiful, and, uh, and afterwards, whether they are uh, which one is brighter or not. So beautiful is aesthetical judgment, uh, brightness is a perceptual judgment. So first of all, uh, 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 the stimuli, they had different types of stimuli. Some had uh, scenes and they elicited activation. That's not contrasted, yes, to, to beauty or brightness, just the, st the uh, stimuli itself elicited response. Uh, in the parahippocampal areas, uh, these areas that are involved in uh, um, perception of space, that's something that uh, I described a uh, um, um, few, few weeks, few months ago uh, with respect to perception of space uh, in paintings. 
Uh, and the, 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 the phases, elicited activation in the phase areas, that, uh, in the fusiform gyres that uh, Alon was mentioning, uh, and uh, in the amygdala. Uh, so uh, what about the, the aesthetical versus perceptual judgment? So uh, these are the regions that uh, uh, showed increased activation for aesthetical uh, versus perceptual judgment, and one of them is the or orbital frontal cortex, this putative beauty region of the brain. Uh, but there were other regions like the somata, um, uh, uh, the sensory motor areas that, that I showed before, the cerebellar uh, area, some, uh, some of the reward uh, uh, areas, the globus pallidus and the putamen, and, uh, and also the amygdala. So contrary to uh, what was shown before, that, that it's really the, uh, the medial orbital frontal cortex, which is the, the nucleus, that's the, the, the area, it's not the nucleus, it's the cortical region, uh, that is responsible for beauty. It seems here that there are other regions that are involved in, in uh, in this comparison, that are uh, uh, that they differ between aesthetic versus perceptual judgment, but orbital frontal cortex is still one of these regions uh, that is dealing more with aesthetics than with perceptual judgment. And they, the authors, sort of uh, propose the scheme. Uh, just mentioned briefly that uh, uh, there are two pathways: one involving the orbital frontal cortex involving the uh, aesthetic judgment, the other one involving the perceptual uh, judgment. And uh, on top of that, there are two motor pathways are, uh, which are associated with, uh, uh, with this uh, uh, evaluation, uh, with this sort of judgment. So uh, interestingly, uh, so four years ago, there was another study that showed that actually uh, um, came with, with similar paradigm but actually extended it. So uh, in this experiment uh, subjects were shown faces and they had to rate uh, the face from very unattractive to very attractive. Then they were uh, uh, presented with a sort of uh, uh, moral uh, goodness judgment. So they had to, to judge, in this case, uh, the uh, sentence he rescued an abandoned dog. They had to judge it from very bad to very good, uh, and then they were had to, to judge as this was a control uh, where something is bright or not, very dark or very bright. And, uh, uh, and guess what? The orbital frontal cortex were, was active for uh, the uh, attractiveness judgment. So the more attractive uh, uh, was was the stimuli, according to the participants, the more activation was in the orbital frontal cortex, but the same region was also active for moral judgment. So the higher, the, the, the sort of the, the goodness rating, the, the more, the, the, I, uh, the, the better was, well, it was better, it's, it's the gooder, well, I can't, I don't know if such word exists, but the, the more uh, sort of moral was the judgment, the more activation in the orbital frontal cortex uh, was shown, and this didn't happen for uh, uh, for perceptual uh, um, contrast. So, so different uh, brightness didn't elicit a special response in the orbital frontal cortex. So the conclusion here uh, is either. Uh, goodness and beauty are related, uh, or is that orbital frontal cortex, as was shown in many studies before, is just uh, is, is a region that is dealing with complex decision-making processes, not just perceptual, but some, some complex evaluation of, of, uh, of uh, reward and probability of rewards. Um, and, uh, and by the way, this, this properties, the uh, goodness and the uh, beautifulness were, uh, were highly correlated, the response in the orbital frontal cortex. To the conclude uh, this, this short part on whether there is a beauty center in the brain uh, um, and, the, the, and the topics that we touched in the, in the first part of the lecture today. So, there are several evolutionary and culturally conserved beauty principles uh, in the brain. That's what we propose. One of them is probably symmetry, whether the waist to hip ratio is something universal or not, that's uh, a debate. 
Uh, some aesthetic experience, both visual and auditory, result in activation of reward and motiva motivational neurocircuits, uh, thus highlighting uh, their possible adaptive evolutionary origin. So if something is linked to reward uh, so strongly, uh, it means that it probably uh, has really an adaptive value for us. This is linked to the uh, Ronnie Granot uh, talk about what is the adaptive value of music. And, and this is probably uh, can be generalized to to other forms of art, including maybe complex art that that that, that you uh, uh, that you were mentioning. Uh, um, uh, but not every aesthetic judgment is linked to the reward system. This example with uh, uh, with the fact that uh, male participants uh, were uh, scoring uh, uh, were were defining. Uh, beautiful male faces, but were not uh, attracted to that to them, and therefore their reward system was not activated. This is kind of a kind of a contraexample to that. And it remains to be tested whether the orbitofrontal cortex represents the beauty, the ultimate beauty center in the brain, or as I said, it's just a region, in, region involved in complex or maybe abstract evaluation decision task, or maybe, uh, as Kant uh, said, that there isn't. Uh, uh, nothing that makes me wonder uh, so much as the starry sky above me and the moral law within me. In other words, uh, according uh, to Kant, uh, beauty and goodness uh, is the same thing. So maybe the orbitofrontal region is sort of a kind of Kantian uh, center for beauty, and I'm sure that if this is the case, uh, the church will be very happy to hear that. Um, so. Uh, and finally, uh, aesthetic judgment involves other perceptual categories. Uh, uh, according to uh, like the philosophical definition of what is uh, aesthetics, uh, aesthetical feeling is everything that, beyond, that is beyond the senses and can be modulated by cognition but doesn't have a, sub a real objective value. So, uh, so for example, a feeling of sore, I can be touched by something, I can be moved by that, but that will be my subjective aesthetical feeling. It doesn't uh, uh, necessarily uh, involves uh, a sensation of beauty. It's just a other type of emotion. And it would be interesting to see if that sort of aesthetical uh, experiences have similar or different um, mechanisms to those described for paintings and, uh, and, and music. Um, so, um, so the next uh, sort of uh, subject is whether uh, um, there is uh, a cognitive basis for creativity, whether all uh, uh, this beautiful mind and beautiful brains that creates all these sorts of art uh, has has um, a creative principle in it. Uh, and one of the things that was uh, maybe the thing that is most linked to uh, to creativity is synesthesia. Uh, so the example above is how synesthetes. Uh, sort of, this, this is grapheme to color synesthesia, the perception of uh, letters and numbers uh, uh, as uh, with, with, with colors. That's how uh, a synesthet of that sort, of that type, will experience, will read this, this phrase uh, or this, this number. Um, and uh, like kind of one funny anecdote, uh, uh, there was this, uh, this girl that was telling uh, uh, her father that as she writes the letter R and she uh, um, adds this diagonal line, the color of the letter P changes from pink to blue. And so that's an example of a, a synesthetic experience. And uh, uh, this is another example of uh, grapheme to number uh, synesthesia. So, so people often uh, view numbers as sort of special, uh, in a special arrangement, sometimes with different colors. And many famous people uh, were synesthetes of that sort, like Nabokov and Feynman, etc. This is an example of a month to color synesthesia. So that's uh, how uh, this synesthetic person 
perceive uh, the months, uh, different months of the year. It's kind of a spiral with different colors. And there is also a rare type of synesthesia, the mirror to touch synesthesia. So these synesthetes feel uh, that they are being touched when they see someone else being touched. And this is related uh, to what uh, I described uh, the mirror neuron system and the empath empathic brain. But while normally we just see a mirror uh, response uh, without the actual sensation of being touched, unless in some extreme cases uh, that arts bring us to, like in movies, these people uh, experience it on on everyday basis. and. Uh, uh, and the basic uh, sort of mechanism of synesthesia that was proposed that, uh, that uh, synesthesia results from uh, unusual rewiring of, of the brain, so different brain regions that are not normally talking to each other. Uh, uh, for example, the, the numeric regions in the parietal cortex some becomes linked to the visual areas. Uh, in the occipital lobe, for example, and that creates this uh, this link of uh, uh, of unrelated con concept, and this is basically what metaphor is. Yes, right. Metaphor is is bringing two unrelated concepts and bringing them together. So this is synesthesia is probably the ultimate uh, 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 brain metaphor. So whether it relates to creativity. Uh, or not, it's a question Ramachandran uh, was proposing that depending on where and how widely in the brain the trait was expressed, it could lead to both synesthesia and to a propensity towards linking seemingly unrelated concepts and ideas in short creativity. This would explain why the apparently useless synesthesia gene has survived in the population. That's, that's Ramachandran. And uh, there were uh, several reports uh, uh, um, that synesthetes are more engaged in arts, there are more synesthetic students in art schools. There are, of course, many examples of like famous composers, uh, so Liszt and Rimsky Korsakov, for example, were, were arguing about the exact colors of, of the different keys. And so there were f synesthetes, uh, often, com often musicians uh, uh, sort of hear. Uh, 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 sorry, see the colors of of, uh, uh, of the different notes. So, uh, so this synesthesia is one thing that was suggested to link to creativity. Another uh, thing is dyslexia, um, and uh, maybe one of the interesting examples is uh, the artist Chuck Close. So, uh, he was uh, dyslectic, um, and uh, as uh, uh, well, I guess he still is. And uh, as, uh, as a kid, he had uh, trouble reading, uh, but he liked to draw. And, and uh, on top of that, he was uh, prosopagnosic. So he, he couldn't recognize faces well, identify faces, uh, conditions that Alon was, uh, was describing before. Uh, and his art sort of evolved uh, from, from his method uh, of how he was recognizing faces in everyday life. So he was sort of uh, deconstructing the face into, into different features in, in order to try to identify who's, who is the person in front of him. And he started painting in this way by, by painting uh, uh, portraits in a pixel-like manner. In, which in each pixel, he was uh, introducing different uh, geometrical shapes, and this created this this magnificent portraits that uh, that he became famous for. This is an example of uh, how sort of developmental uh, uh, condition leads to uh, to very unusual artistic style and a uh, very creative one. And uh, again, there were links. Uh, uh, it, 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 it's claimed that uh, dyslexic people have more tendency towards uh, art. What's the causal direction of this? Whether they move to art because uh, because of certain experience uh, difficulties in other fields, or vice versa, is, is, is of course an open question. So uh, another uh, involvement um, um, of different brain conditions. Uh, and the link to creativity comes uh, from uh, studying damage uh, to the different uh, parts of the brain. And uh, Alon described patients that uh, uh, drew more 
uh, more precisely after certain lesions uh, that they experience, but uh, drawing more precisely and being more obsessed with, with the details is not necessarily creativity, maybe it's actually the opposite of it. And uh, the idea uh, in general that, that's sort of kind of the dominant idea uh, is that the right hemisphere is the creative hemisphere and uh, the left hemisphere is the sort of the logical, the analytical one and the left hemisphere uh, inhibits uh, the creative right hemisphere and, uh, and uh, uh, like one of, one of the key evidence to that is that uh, uh, right hemisphere responds more to novelty than, uh, and than the left hemisphere and uh, uh, people who suffer uh, dementia especially in the prefrontal areas in the left hemisphere often uh, starts well, not often, but there were several reports of that, start to uh, uh, become facilitated in their creative talents. Usually these are people who were, are, had talents before already. Uh, and also uh, the same holds for brain damage to the left hemisphere. Um, and uh, correspondingly, damage to the right hemisphere results in loss uh, of artistic sense. One example of, uh, of a person who uh, suffered from uh, dementia affecting preferably, uh, preferentially the left hemisphere is that of an art school teacher, Jen C. Chung. So as, uh, uh, as her dementia progressed, she became uh, she sort of moved away from the realistic style and, and started to, to paint in, in a more bold, more creative manner, uh, eh, 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 resulting in, in, in these uh, interesting uh, eh, paintings. Um, another um, window into the creative brain is uh, what happens in, uh, in autism. Uh, the special cases of autistic savants, these uh, uh, children uh, uh, who are uh, disabled in, in many functions but are sort of genius and way above average in, in others. Usually uh, it's restricted to several categories uh, involving painting, uh, uh, numerical skills, uh, and, uh, and playing music. It's rarely composing with music, but usually it's, it's performing music, uh, usually uh, on a piano. Uh, this is a case, a famous case of the autistic girl uh, Nadia, uh, um, who, who was, uh, 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 the psychologist self published a book uh, and the follow up of this book. Uh, so uh, this is uh, uh, a drawing of a normal uh, a normal child of uh, five to eight years old. And this is uh, a drawing, a horse drawing uh, by Nadia at age of five. Uh, so she was obsessed with, with horses. She, she, she was drawing horses a lot. This is a, a, her drawing, uh, I think, at the age of three. And this is the corresponding drawings of age matched uh, uh, normal uh, children. And uh, what is uh, and, and this is a sketch uh, by Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, so what is the most interesting thing is that while she was drawing uh, this, this very, very vivid, very natural, uh, um, uh, very impressive uh, uh, paintings, uh, her verbal skills almost didn't exist. So she was not verbal, she... Uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, and it, from what I heard, uh, from what I read, that as her, uh, uh, with age, she, she, she did manage to develop certain verbal abilities, and this was uh, correlated with decrease in her artistic abilities. So that uh, again fa favors this, this idea that the left hemisphere, uh, the verbal hemisphere, once it becomes more developed, it sort of inhibits, inhibits the creative right hemisphere. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, ability to, to, drew, uh, to draw extraordinary um, and vivid uh, images without having um, sort of a normal uh, uh, mind, uh, without verbal abilities, uh, also challenges the hypothesis of the famous art historian Gomblich that was stating that the fact that we have uh, images of uh, 
these this very elaborate images of animals uh, in uh, prehistoric caves, this is from the Chauvet cave, uh, drawn uh, probably some 30,000 years ago, uh, hints to the fact that at already 30,000 years ago, humans had evolutionary, modern, developed uh, mind. They were like us in terms of, of the mind. But the fact that uh, uh, a, a, a child that could not speak, that didn't have any variable abilities, still managed to, uh, to draw uh, such beautiful horses, maybe links, uh, maybe uh, suggests that uh, the, the mind of, uh, of these prehistoric people was still evolving and was not uh, mature yet. Um, and uh, um, one of the things with creativity is that often uh, it's really hard to say where, where it comes from. So there, so there were uh, several stages proposed. That there is the preparation period, the incubation period, and then a creative insight uh, that sort of characterizes the, the creative process. And, uh, and the key thing here is that uh, a lot of creative, uh, uh, creative experiences are often reported as, as, uh, as unconscious. So, the, so the, the, uh, the subject suddenly experience a creative insight, uh, sometimes without consciously thinking of on, uh, 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 on the subject. So uh, uh, this was tested in, uh, uh, in two related studies. One, one uh, uh, was published in Science in, in Science 2006. Uh, so in this work, uh, the subject had to choose between uh, uh, different products, a shampoo, a CD, shoes, plane ticket, camera, and room. Uh, uh, it's, re it's sorted by the complexity of the choice, so it's easy to choose a shampoo in the supermarket. It's uh, less uh, easy to choose what room uh, uh, to, uh, to rent, uh, in the, uh, which apartment to rent. And uh, there are two conditions. In one, the subjects were presented with the, with the different choice options, and they had a few minutes, I think about three minutes, to think about it and then choose. Or uh, they were presented with, the, uh, with a different list, but then these three minutes they ha were distracted. They had to do some, some other tasks that uh, prevented them from consciously thinking about their choice. And uh, it was found, and, and this study was, was replicated in various uh, other uh, uh, paradigms. It was found that for simple actions, uh, the post-choice satisfaction was more, uh, was higher for conscious choices. So you're more satisfied from the cho choice of which shampoo to buy if you have conscious time, a, a, a time to consciously think of what you're going to choose. But for more complex decisions, such as buying plane ticket, a, a camera, or, or a room, uh, it's better if, if you stop for a second, do something else. In the, in the meanwhile, there is unconscious uh, sort of processing, and then you come up with, with an answer. Uh, and the idea was that, uh, that maybe while uh, uh, conscious thinking is sort of uh, uh, sequential linear thinking, the, conscious, the unconscious thinking uh, in, involves parallel processing, which is better for, for more complex uh, evaluation. Uh, so how does it link uh, to creativity? Uh, so the same authors uh, were tested subjects for sort of creative solutions. So they had to, uh, in the similar paradigm, they were presented with a task, for, for example, to make a list of places starting with the letter A. Or things of, uh, of different things one can do with a brick. And then uh, they were either given conscious time to, to give the answer, or the subjects were engaged in, conscious, in, in, in a, a destruction task, and then while they had unconsciously thinking about it, probably, uh, and then uh, uh, we're asked to give the solution. And uh, in both uh, sort of uh, tasks, uh, the, the result, the answer, for example, the list of, let of things became becoming, uh, beginning with A, was much more richer and variable and creative uh, 
uh, if they had unconscious time to think of. Uh, so this, so this uh, sort of links the fact that the, the, the suggests that uh, creativity involves a subconscious uh, processing. And one of the things with, uh, with, uh, with subconscious processing is that sometimes the solution comes uh, uh, as an insight, the aha moment. For example, as uh, in the case of the Dalmatian dog, uh, you don't see it and all of a sudden all comes together and this is aha moment, you, you realize it and, and you see it. And, and this is associated, uh, uh, as Roma children suggest, with, with increased satisfaction, with increased reward. So, uh, if creativity uh, is linked to the right hemisphere, so maybe the insight moment is also associated to the right hemisphere, and uh, this is a combined um, fMRI and EEG study, I present only the fMRI part of it, in which the subjects were presented in the scanner uh, with a task uh, that can, could be solved either uh, systematically or with the creative insight. So they had, uh, for example, to, uh, to combine, uh, to, to, to find a word that you can combine with all of these three words. So for example, pine, crab, and sauce, the answer is apple. You can get a pineapple, a crab apple, and an apple sauce. And uh, you can uh, work on this systematically by, by uh, by trial and error, kind of going through a list, or it just comes all of a sudden, an apple. Yes, so, um, um, uh, and, and the subjects had to then to report if they were, came to the solution by insight or by systematic uh, uh, working. And in the case of insight versus non-insight uh, mode of, of solving the task, uh, the uh, anterior superior temporal gyrus in the right hemisphere was consistently active. So during this aha moment, uh, uh, the anterior superior temporal gyrus was active, and actually it was even active a bit before the aha moment. So indeed, this creative insight is linked to the activity in the right hemisphere. So if the right hemisphere is the sort of creative center of the brain, the creative part, so maybe, and it's according to, to, to this hypothesis that, that I presented before, it's uh, constantly inhibited by the left hemisphere. So maybe if we remove the inhibition f of the left hemisphere, we will get emergence of uh, creative talents in normal subjects, as happens in subjects with, uh, with damage or uh, other neurological conditions to the left hemisphere. So the person who is doing these experiments or creating a, a uh, um, savants for a day I, is Alan Snyder from Australia. Uh, so, so savants, uh, as I said, were uh, um, there are different types of savant-like uh, abilities. One of them is drawing. Uh, the other is a numerical skills. So, uh, Oliver Zacks described these uh, uh, twins, these autistic twins that had exceptional numerical skills. So for example, when uh, matches were falling from, from a matchbox, uh, they both, in the same time, uh, within a few seconds, they say there are 123 matches on the floor. And they both give the same answer. Uh, so that's, that is a similar task to this match counting. So the subjects had to, to say uh, how many dots are here. And uh, while they're doing that, uh, their left hemisphere is subjected to a transcranial, transcranial uh, magnetic stimulation, TMS, which is a technique uh, which uh, sort of induces a magnetic, uh, through, through a magnetic field, induce currents uh, in the brain. Sometimes it, it can be done also for deep areas, and uh, it's, it, you can either uh, inhibit or activate the area, and this, was, this is actually used as a treatment uh, for depression. And the, using uh, uh, this TMS technique, the left hemisphere was transiently inhibited. And uh, uh, the authors reported that uh, normal subjects after tr uh, TMS treatment uh, had improved uh, scores in this task. Another uh, example, they were, uh, again, 
subjecting people to normal, normal individuals to TMS and they were asked to draw, in this case a dog, so this is a practice. And this is actually not from the paper, I couldn't find images in this paper, but it's actually from a blog uh, of a person who was uh, one of the participants in this study, so that's his normal uh, drawing of a dog during practice. This is before the TMS, this is during TMS, and this is some 45 minutes after uh, TMS. So the claims that uh, um, and, and as a result of TMS, uh, the drawing capabilities, the variability, the richness uh, increase. So uh, Alan Snyder is uh, sort of the, uh, the advocate of, of, of making um, a creative cap, so everyone will go with a, a little helmet and if a certain point during the day you're stuck and like no creative ideas are coming, you put it, you get some 15 minutes of transcranial, it's transcr transcranial magnetic stimulation and you suddenly get a creative insight that will help you to go through the day. Yes? Does it last for longer if, if someone is, uh, you know, uh, the subject of the experiment once, does it help further to evoke this? Uh yeah, so f for, for example, in the case of depression, th this, is, uh, this is done clinically, uh, and uh, in, the, in the case of depression, uh, subjects are going, depends on, uh, on the severity of depression, sometimes once a week, sometimes every day, but the idea is that it lasts uh, for the whole day afterwards. Or, or even for more than uh, several days. So in the case of depression, the idea is that you, you, you get also change of the neurotransmitter levels. Here is more uh, dealing with inhibition of the left, left hemisphere. Uh, so I expect that the duration will be shorter. Uh, and and uh, I, I think this, this, in this case, the after is 45 minutes after. I'm, I'm not sure if they tested for, for like, several days afterwards. What would be the side effects if someone used this helmet? I believe personally that enormous, but uh, <laughs> because, uh, well, you, although you can make focal uh, sort of inhibition, but you know, all your linguistic, uh, uh, many of your linguistic skills are, are in, the, in the left hemisphere and um, I mean, uh, you know, if, if a left hemisphere is involved with rational judgments, your uh, evaluation of the world can you can be maybe very creative, but I don't know. To do it once or twice, just uh, you know, later on people while learning or while thinking could you know just remember or evolve this feeling of uh, you know having one low suppressed or whatever, and then uh, it could help to. Reach Yes, well, I, I think personally the best is uh, like right after lunch when the, I personally feel <laughs> creativity is really dropping, so 15 minutes and you're back on, on track. So, but uh, yeah, that, that's really, uh, well, you, you see the, the years, it's, it's really uh, ongoing. Maybe, maybe something will come out of that, but um, and yes. Yeah, well, I'm I, I'm not familiar with studies. I don't know if 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 there are any that uh, were actually uh, uh, scanning scanning the subjects in fMRI right after after TMS. Uh, it's it's impossible to do it during the TMS stimulation. Um, so I so I cannot answer answer you definitely, but uh, but the general the general principle that that uh, it it evokes uh, sort of uh, it evokes currents uh, in a relatively focal area depends on on the strength of the stimulation. Uh, uh, so it's not a suppression per se, just sort of abnormal activity, and. Uh, uh, to which extent it spreads, it's, uh, um, I believe it very much de depends on which area exactly uh, you stimulate. So, yeah, if uh, sort of activation of the right temporal, well, probably you, 
you, you might if it's it's if it's just not functioning, you might you might get a boost. If it's uh, uh, just functioning normally, but there is some inhibition from the left hemisphere, maybe there will be no change. But, uh, but it's really pure speculations because uh, I, and I, I'm not aware of studies that, that stimulated uh, in the right hemisphere and, and looked for, for emergence of artistic talents. Yes. So, or well maybe to, to to say it in different words, it's uh, easier to disinhibit an area with this technique than sort of interfere uh, with, uh, with the functioning of, with the normal functioning of, of an area, because uh, because it, every every stimulation like, like this is a perturbation. Um, so uh, so to conclude. Uh, uh, so to conclude this part, several conditions such as synesthesia and dyslexia are linked to enhanced creativity. Um, artistic ability, especially drawing, might anti-correlate with verbal abilities. And, uh, and, and, and this uh, um, um, so, sort of proposes interesting questions with respect to uh, um, development of, of of the brain, uh, uh, evolutionary speaking. Uh, creative insight, this aha moment, um, is associated with the right hemisphere. Inhibition of the left hemisphere results in facilitation of creativity and uh, emergence of savant-like capabilities. So this is it, and uh, thank you. And thank you for coming to this course. Um, um, if you have other questions on, on this topic or maybe something related to the final assignment, we, by the way, posted it and it, uh, it has to be submitted somewhere in the end of July.